We're going to be in Romans chapter 8. I did this for our church two or three weeks ago, and I titled it called Stinkin' Thinkin'. Stinkin' Thinkin'. How Christians happen to think wrongly sometimes. We as Christians don't think wrongly ever, do we? No, we don't think wrongly. We never think wrong at all, do we? I mean, Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 8. And I'll begin by reading the text. <laughs> but I'm going to start out by quoting or reading chapters, chapter 12, uh, 1 and 2, just to kind of give a little heads up here where, I'm, where I get my thinking, where I'm starting with here. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may be proved what, that, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, by the renewing of your mind. And then we'll go back to chapter 8 here. As I was reading this and thinking about it, it, just, it hit home with me on a lot of things that I, you know, Christians do a lot of, in my opinion, do we do a lot of wrongful thinking. And I, I brought this up to my class. Oh, no, we don't do wrongful thinking. We don't. But we're human too, aren't we? We think just like the world does. We were, at one point in our life, we were worldly before we got saved, weren't we? At one point in our life, and even to this day, we get drawn into the worldly pleasures. We get drawn into the things of this world. So I'm going to start. Let's start out by reading verses one through eight, and then we'll then we'll dive into it a little bit. But before we begin, let's start up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word and what it has for us. And Lord, I just pray that you would speak through me. Through the whole, use the Holy Spirit through me, not my words, but your words. Help us to grasp this, help us to understand it, help us to be able to apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Paul is writing here, and he's writing to, well, he's writing to us, but he's writing to Christians back in his day too, challenging them to think about the way they live their lives challenging them to, to think about how they, and reminding them not to be living in the flesh. But let's back up a little bit to Romans chapter 7, because if you back up a little bit to Romans chapter 7, Paul is questioning himself. He says, why do I do the things that I don't want to do? Why do I do them things? I'm born again. He'd already had that conversion on Damascus, the road to Damascus, but he says, I still want to do these things over here that I know I shouldn't be doing, and I don't do the things that I want to do. Why? He's beating himself up. Verse 24, he says, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? And that wretched man, he's talking about himself. He's like, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of failing. I'm tired of falling down. I'm tired of just, I'm exhausted. 
He's like, who's going to save me from this? Who's going to do this for me? I can't do this anymore. I can't live this life anymore. He says, I just can't do it. That wretched man means he's exhausted. He's beat up. He's tired. In verse 25, he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but the flesh, the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. He is thankful that there is no condemnation. He is thankful that even though he does the things he doesn't want to do, He's not judged for it because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He says, I can struggle with this all my life, but he says, I don't have to give in to it. I don't have to, to yield to it. But I can thank God I am forgiven and I'm not going to be judged for it. Now, I've come up with five ways that Christians think wrongly to get back to our text in Romans chapter 8. How many of you like to play Family Feud or watch Family Feud? I've watched it with uh, Steve Harvey, and one of the funny ones that come up was he asked the question, name something that goes with pork. So he went down the aisle, and he come up to this one guy, and he says, name something that goes with pork. And the guy said, you pine. Pork, you pine. Everybody else was naming loin and chops and pork chop sandwiches and pulled pork and all this. This guy's pork, you pine. <laughs> well, I come up with five common ways that Christians think plain wrongly. And I'm going to start with number five because you know how that's most how generally everybody goes is backwards. <laughs> Number five is pharisaical thinking. Everything is external. Look at me. It's prideful thinking. Look at me. If you remember the, Christian, the Pharisees, when they prayed, they had to do it way out in the public, and they had to take forever. They prayed these long prayers that, you know, Lord, you know, and just long words that nobody else could understand and they just were there forever and ever and ever they had to look good they had to dress right they had everything was about themselves jesus even called them out he says you need to worry about what's on the inside wash the cup on the inside you can't don't worry about the outside First Samuel 16, 7 says, Jesus looks on the heart, looks on the inside. But the Pharisees are worried about what's on the outside. The fourth way that people think wrongly is like an umpire. Now, I'm not a huge sports fan, but if I had to do sports, it'd be baseball. And I don't know how many baseball fans we have here, but have you ever watched a an umpire behind home plate, when he stands there, he calls balls and strikes. He's judging the, the pitcher, correct? He's judging how the pitcher throws the ball. And for those of you that aren't quite sure or understand, strike zone is between the knees and the shoulders, and it's 23 inches wide. So he's got this strike zone to, to pitch this, the pitcher to, us, to throw this ball. And when the pitcher gets it right, the umpire hollers, strike. Strike! And he's loud enough that everybody in the ballpark can hear it. But when the pitcher throws it outside of the strike zone, ball, and most of the time you just see him stand up and just do this number. He doesn't really say much. A lot of that, way, a lot of the way that some Christians are like that, we judge what other people are doing, 
And if they're doing something wrong, we won't say a word. We'll just stand up like the umpire when, instead of calling ball, the ball where people can. And Jesus tells us we're supposed to hold each other accountable. We're not to judge them, but we're to hold them accountable. We're to, we're to go up and tap them on the shoulder and say, you know, I don't think this thing quite lines up with, the, with Scripture. I don't think what you're doing is quite lining up the way that a Christian should live. But when they're living rightly, we'll praise them and we'll lift them up and put them on a pedestal and stuff. The third way that Christians think wrongly is socialist. We think we got to go after a culture. We got to change the culture. When, cult when cultures don't get changed, individuals are the ones that get changed. We need to be going after individuals. And in today's world, we got this wokeness going on in our society. You know, they're trying to change the way we think, trying to, but they're trying to do everybody at once. And a lot of our, you've got to be careful about who you listen to as far as who your teach, who the preachers are, because they're watering down our gospel. I've listened to even some of the, the songs on the radio anymore that they call it Christian music, they call it gospel music or whatever. Some of it is so watered down that it's, I can't even listen to it anymore. A lot of times when I'm working, because I drive a semi, I, I turn the radio off and just ride in silence because I can't listen to the other stuff. But we're socialists. We think wrongly. We have to jump in with society. We have to think we're part of this. This is who I am. No, it's not. We're Christians. We're to stand out amongst other people. We're to be in the world, but not of the world. And we need to be working on talking to other individuals, not talking to groups of people. Nothing wrong with going up and standing in front of a congregation, or if you get it, like Billy Graham used to go talk to uh, arenas of people. But he, did you ever see him convert a whole arena? He usually reached individuals. It wasn't masses and masses and masses. It had been awesome if it was masses. <laughs> but the Lord works on the indiv individual hearts. The second way that people think wrongly is a historian. What happened? It's in the past, but we can't get over it. We keep bringing it forward. We keep, what happened to me? What happened to them? What happened to you? That happened back there. Leave it there. Learn from it. Let it go. Don't keep dredging it up. It's not going to serve a purpose. Number one is hedonist. We think wrongly because we think like a hedonist. It's all about me, myself, and I. Look what I did. Look what I can do. What can I get out of this? How is it going to serve me? How is it going to work for me? These are all the way Christians think wrongly. And back to our text, it talks about being in the flesh. If you go down to verse 5, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. These are all things that bring up the flesh. These are all ways that we as Christians get drawn into our, our fleshly, Life, we get drawn into the things of the world. <coughs> Excuse me. And what does flesh mean? If Well, if you take it and flip it around and drop the H, it means self. How can I serve self? What can I do for me? What can I do? It's not worried about... What can I do for you or for you or for the next person? 
or what can I do for my neighbor down the road or anything. It's all about what, what can I do for me. And Paul is warning us about that in this chapter. He's warning us that we need to change the way we think. We have some stinking thinking going on and we need to change the way we think. We need to change our behavior and our thinking habits. Minding the things of the flesh is desire fulfillment thinking. It's all about me. I got to have it now. And it's feelings first. What can I do for me? And I got to have it now. You ever been in a parking lot and you just can't wait? You got to get right up front. So you drive around the parking lot and parking lot and hopefully that person that just walked out to the car, what are they doing? They just got in to leave. Why are they taking forever? Or you're standing in line at Walmart and it seems like the person in front of you is just taking their jolly old time checking out. Now. I want it now. I want it now. Feelings first. It's all about me right now. I got to have that feeling. What What's right for me? It feels good. I don't care how it affects you. I don't care how it makes you feel. As long as it makes me feel good. Paul's telling us, no, 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 no. This ain't how we're supposed to think. This isn't how we're supposed to act. This isn't how we're supposed to behave. We're Christians. By James 12, 2, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We're supposed to be in the scripture daily so that we can learn how to live, learn how to change our thinking, learn how to change our behavior, learn how to change our attitude. Is thinking me first? Got to have it now. I don't care how it makes you feel, the way a Christian is supposed to be feeling. The end of verse 5 there, it says, But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Minding the things of the Spirit is delayed gratification thinking. No, oh, nobody likes that, do they? Nobody likes delayed gratification. You want everything right now. Got to have it now. We can't wait. Can't wait. And how many times have we waited for something and the reward is often greater in the end? Delayed gratification, just think it. John 14, 27 tells us that peace, Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I'll flip over here and Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Jesus gives us that peace, but he's not. it's not something that happens and just... Sometimes it takes a little while. Sometimes we have struggles in our life and we can rely on Jesus to give us a peace. But does that mean that struggle is going to go away? I could tell you some stories right now of personally that my family and I have dealt with since 2018 that we're finally coming to peace with. Maybe I'll share a little bit of it in the next service, but it has taken us three years. And there are times when things happen 
when people will say something that will bring that back up and the emotions that come with it and the hurt. But we have to immediately go back and say, Lord, we have to give it all back to you because we can't deal with it. We need the peace that you give us that it's all a delayed gratification. Minding the things of the Spirit is delayed gratification. We think of kingdom first, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. I'll flip over there real quick. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be ye not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor ephem effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor rilers, revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God, and such were of some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. We know that someday we're going to get to see the kingdom of heaven. But right now we don't get to see it, do we? But that's part of having a delayed gratification because we have that relationship with Jesus Christ because we accepted what he did on the cross for us. I thank God every day for that. I thank God every day for the opportunity to share it with people. And I get the opportunity. I spent a half hour standing in the truck stop parking lot sharing it with a coworker one day. I may never see the results. But you know what? Jesus died for me. I can at least share that with somebody else. And what happens with it? Who knows? Move on to verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death. Whoa. We'll stop right there for a second. It's kind of scary, isn't it? And you're thinking, what do you mean by death? Is that metaphoric death? Oh, no, she posted that picture of us on Facebook. Why did she do that? I could just die. That was just mean and nasty. She should have said something to me. He asked me to get up and say prayer in front of the congregation. I can't do that. I'll just... Is that what he's talking about? No, he's talking about a spiritual death here. He's talking about a spiritual death here. For to be carnally minded is death... We think we're separated from God. When we are carnally minded, we're separated from God. We cannot, we're just, it's like he's over here and we're over here in our own little world. He doesn't even, we don't even, don't even really know who he is. We have no relationship with him. The rest of that verse is, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. To have a relationship with Jesus Christ, to have that relationship with him is, he gives us a, a, a second chance, a, a life eternal, but he gives us peace. At whatever we're going through, at peace of, with life here on earth, and I'm not going to go down a political trail, but you could look at the world today. And if we have that life and relationship with Jesus Christ, we can be with at peace with whatever is happening. We may not like it. I may not like what is going on. I may not, I may look at it or listen to it and say, I don't agree with it. 
But you want to know something? God still sits on the throne. God still is in charge. And regardless of what the powers that be do or say, God is the ultimate authority. And God put in authority who he wants in authority. Romans chapter 13 tells us that. And we're to obey and honor those he puts in authority, regardless of who it is or what they say or do. Difficult sometimes. It can be mighty difficult. And it can be awful difficult to hold our tongue sometimes, can't it? Ephesians 2.1. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Galatians, Ephesians 2. And he hath quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. He has saved us. That quickened means he has saved us. We were once sinners. We were once lost. We were floundering around, flopping around like fish out of water. And he has saved us. We were dead in our sins. We were dead in our trespasses. And he's given us life and peace. Back to Romans 8. Verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Enmity, another word for enmity is hostility or hostile. We are hostile towards God. If we have a carnal mind, we are hostile towards God. I'm in my going into my second year of seminary. And I've taken a couple classes through the summer just to keep up with my studies, but just because I'm an old man and have a hard time. It's been 35 years since I've been in school. So <laughs> one of the classes I'm taking is philosophy. And uh, learning some of these things. But we have one of the questions, that the old philosopher Epicurus try to define God or the existence of God. And basically, his, his definition, he was hostile towards God because he doesn't believe there is a God. Are we like that? Do Christians think wrongly enough to where we think that we're hostile towards God? That we are just, I would hope not. I would hope that once we got saved, that our, our relationship with Christ was, and our salvation was true and honest enough that we would just really mean what we said. That it wasn't just a, a fake salvation. Does our walk walk and our talk talk match? Or is it creating enmity? Is it creating hostility between us and God? For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. In verse 8. So then they are in flesh cannot please God. And if we are in the flesh, we don't even try to please God, do we? Because it's all about us. It's all about what we want, what we do. We don't think about anybody else. We don't even think about God. We may have taken that walk. We may have even gone through the steps of being baptized. But did we really mean it? Or was it just a, a facade? Just, just a front. 
Now, fortunately, we at our church just this month actually celebrated the baptism of about seven different people. I think we had three last week and four about three weeks ago. We can praise the Lord for that. I don't know their hearts, but I pray every day that what they did was true and honest. But the one heart that I can worry about is mine. The one heart that you can worry about is your own. What is your relationship with Jesus Christ? Is it true or is it just a fake shell that you're putting on to make it look good? Do we have some of this stinking thinking going on in our lives? Do we think like the Pharisees? Do we think like an umpire? Do we think socialist that we got to be part of the culture? We got to save the whole world. We got to save instead of just one individual. If each one would reach one. Are we stuck in the past? Can we? Are we dwelling on what happened to us in the past? That it's a f not in letting us move forward. Are we a hedonist that it's all about me? If we can get rid of those stinking thinking thoughts, if we can dwell in the flesh, or the spirit, I'm sorry, if we can dwell in the spirit, we will have some great rewards. Verses 9 through 11 go on and they tell us, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. So if so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is not of his. But once we're saved, the Holy Spirit indwells us. Now it's sad to say, I can remember teaching a Sunday school one time at another church. And the pastor and I were tag teaming and we were doing the gifts of the Spirit. Gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I mentioned the fact that the Holy Spirit indwells us once we're saved. We had a lady get up and walk out. I reached out to her afterwards. The pastor reached out to her. She doesn't believe in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and wanted nothing, part to do, nothing to do with the church after that because we teach the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And she goes to a church that teaches that. The, the Holy Spirit does not indwell anybody. That you have to earn your way to heaven, you have to buy your way to heaven, whatever. All we can do is pray for her now. But right here, Scripture says, the Spirit of God dwell in you. Born again Christians have the Spirit of God dwelling in them. And there's scriptures. Spend your time in scriptures. You can find tons of scriptures that back that up. I challenge you guys to think. I challenge myself on my stinking thinking. How, how do I think? How do I live my life? As a husband, as a father, as a citizen of this country, as a co-worker, how do I exhibit my life? How do I live my life? How am I leading my family? As a leader of a church, how am I leading? Essentially, we're all leaders. We're all part of a family. How are we living? Are we being examples? Or are we living in the flesh? It's all about me. Perfect example was this morning at home. I've still got six kids at home. I've got seven out of the house, but I got six at home. And I have a couple of them that decided to fight over the uh, hairspray. They each have their own bottle. But they had to fight over one particular bottle. I was fixing to get the razor out and shave them both bald. <laughs> there, we'll see who saw it. <laughs> 
a case of stinking thinking. All they cared about was themselves. As a dad, I had to look at that, and I, I could have really gone off the handle on it, but I have to stop myself sometimes and think, how would Jesus handle this? Is it going to do me any good to blow up and get upset? Yeah, I was a little upset because I, I'm raising, trying to raise my kids the way Jesus would raise his kids, how, if he had kids. I'm trying to raise them in, in the life of Christ. Here I am teaching on stinking thinking, and my own kids are stinking thinking. <laughs> but it's understandable because they're only 10 and 12. But even as grown adults, we still have that tendency to have some stinking thinking. And we have a tendency to be selfish. We have a tendency to be arrogant and cocky. So my challenge is that we all put our stinking thinking away, that we all get into the scripture of God and we let it work on our hearts. We let Jesus work on our hearts and our minds and change the way we think, change the way we live. Because we can't do it on our own. Jesus is the one that changes us. Jesus is the one that takes that stinking thinking right out of us and puts the way he thinks and lives in us. Now, he said we were done at 9.30, so I've gone a little over. I don't know. <laughs> so I'll close with a word of prayer, and then we can do whatever, and then we'll meet back here. I guess. <laughs> Our loving Heavenly Father, I thank you again for this opportunity we have to open up your word and to study it. And Lord, I just ask that you would. Help us to grasp it and understand it and apply it to our lives. And Lord, I pray that you would prepare our hearts for the next service. In Jesus' name, amen.